The next session, which is uh, with Professor William Simmons, University of Arizona, and Janice Boynton, artist and educator. And uh, the title of theirs is How a uh, Soto Scientific Communication Technique Clouds Issues of Disabilities and Abuse in the Court System. Um, Professor William Simmons is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Director of the Human Rights Practice Program at the University of Arizona. He has more than 25 years of experience as a human rights educator and researcher including serving as a consultant in a wide range of contexts in the Gambia, Senegal, Niger, Ghana, Nigeria, Mozambique, Bangladesh, China, Mexico, and the United States. His research is highly interdisciplinary and draws upon many different methodologies using theoretical, legal, qualitative, and quantitative approaches to advance human rights for marginalized populations. His books include Joyful Human Rights, Human Rights Law and the Marginalized Other, and Binational Human Rights, the US-Mexico Experience. His articles have appeared in such journals as Perspective on Politics, Human Rights Quarterly, Dubois Review, Human, Journal of Human Rights, International Journal of Feminist Politics, International Migration Review, Violence Against Women, Yale, Human Rights and Development Law Journal, the Journal of International Human Rights, Social Science Quarterly, and Philosophy and Social Criticism. Janice Boyton is an artist, educator, and advocate for evidence-based practices in the field of communication sciences and disorders. Her story as a former facilitator was featured on Frontline's Prisoners of Silence. To date, she is one of the few facilitators worldwide to publicly acknowledge her role in producing FC messages and speak out against its use. She left teaching to pursue her artwork, but has continued to be active in educating people about the dangers of FC and other facilitator influence techniques. She is co-founder of the website facilitatedcommunication.org. Hello, uh, Janice and Professor William Simmons. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. And is our uh, PowerPoint showing? I assume it is. It is showing indeed. I will pass it over to you both. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you to you and the organizers for putting on such a wonderful two-day event. We've learned so much. and. Uh, thank you for the audience uh, for uh, staying to the bitter end. We really appreciate this. Um, I, um, I'll start by saying that some of our um, material might be a little challenging for some folks. Uh, some of the things we're going to say might strike some as being controversial. Uh, some uh, also alludes to sexual assault, uh, but we won't go into any great detail on that. Um, and I'll also um, say that, especially for neurodiverse people in the audience, we'll be jumping around a little bit. Um, our uh, presentation uh, has a lot of material on it, and we'll only be highlighting certain pieces of the slides. Um, if you want to see the whole, sli whole uh, slide deck, just let us know. We'll be happy to forward those to you. And um, Janice and I haven't really um, practiced this as, as such. As, we will jump back and forth. Uh, we find that when we, we talk, we often are finishing each other's sentences. So hopefully that will carry on uh, to this presentation as well. Um, first of all, just a general outline. Um, well, first we'll talk about our positionality, which I think is pretty unique for uh, this research project. Uh, then uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna be talking mostly about the um, technique of facilitated communication and its um, uh, uh, related techniques such as spelling to communicate and rapid prompting method. And we'll, we'll ground that in the neurodiversity literature and movement. Then we will talk about the Anna Stubblefield case uh, out of New Jersey. Uh, and then uh, two legal issues, uh, expert witness testimony in the US and epistemic responsibility and willful ignorance. And we'll describe what those are a little bit more. Um, Janice has put together a, first of all, she is the uh, uh, co-director of the facilitatedcommunication.org website, which is the clearinghouse to go to for any information on this. And then she's put together a supplement uh, for um, uh, this specific talk, uh, which is just fantastic. And I think she'll put that in the chat. Um, instead of showing you it very quickly I, and, and risking uh, screwing up the uh, share screen, I'll um, uh, just uh, encourage you to check that out. But it has our sources, it has 
links to a lot more information on these topics. Our positionality, which I think is very unique, especially when you consider our third author on our recent article. Um, so facilitated communication, as I think many of you know, is a technique that developed in the 70s and 80s and came to the US in the 90s uh, to uh, advance uh, communication abilities or to allow people with severe autism and, and similar um, uh, afflictions to be able to uh, speak or at least to communicate. And uh, it was quickly shown to be to not uh, uh, be subject, is not to hold up to empirical testing. Um, however, uh, in looking at such a technique, I have pre I, my major research is on human rights of marginalized peoples, and I look at how the law silences marginalized folks. So I am prone to be gung ho for any new technique, any new way of, of thinking about how people might communicate differently, how um, people's knowledge systems might be different. And that's kind of the research I do around the globe. Uh, so when I heard about facilitated communication, I thought, well, this is something that, you know, this might be a really cool thing for me. And I, I'm more than, you know, I, so this is something that really fit in very well um, with my research. Uh, Janice? I was, um became involved with facilitated communication in the early 1990s. It was actually a year after um, it became popular in the United States and um, probably worked with facilitated communication for, for about a year. And um, there were several facilitators working with the person, you know, well, we have a slide I think on some of this, but, um, it turned out that we generated, the facilitators generated um, allegations of abuse against the family the, of the child we were working with. And we were faced with a situation about, um, you know, we weren't really sure what, what we had with facilitated communication, but if this was a neurotypical person, what would we do to move forward? So, um, it, it actually led to allegations of abuse and um, a court situation. Um, the outcome was that the, we tested it and the facilitation actually came from me and not, not the person with um, difficulties. So um, it, it put us in a sort of interesting or put me in an interesting situation where I believed in facilitated communication wanted it to work, but then we tested it and it, it didn't. So then what do you do? How do you move forward? Um, and the research from that point on has, the scientific research has um, backed up my personal experience with facilitated communication. And that's partly why I continue to talk about it. So Bill. Yeah, and uh, so Janice has kind of been living this for almost three decades now and what, what the scientists have found is that facilitated communication relies on the idiomotor effect, which we'll talk about briefly in the next slide. But uh, that's a technique that's used often by magicians to get to kind of do self-deception of an audience member. And so when I started doing research on this, I thought, well, I happen to know Todd Landman, who's a leading human rights scholar, but he's also a world-class magician. And so we called Todd and asked him if he wanted to be part of it. And he quickly said, oh, magicians talk about this all the time. And he gave us sources from like 1800s of magicians um, uh, Bibles basically uh, that talk about these techniques. And um, he even said, well, I, I actually used some of those techniques in my show in London last night. So that was very interesting. So I think we have a very interesting positionality uh, for taking on uh, this, this, this type of research. The claims are pretty controversial on, um, uh, I think, uh, well, let's, let's say the, the, the claims are um, pretty compelling. Um, you may know of the book, The Reason I Jump, uh, which was written by, uh, allegedly written by a Japanese boy um, when he was 13 years old. 
It was a New York Times bestseller back in 2013. Um, went on to be made into a movie that uh, was at the uh, Sundance Film Festival. And then um, a book uh, came out a few years ago, I Am In Here by Elizabeth Bonker. Um, these books have been highly praised, as you can see, by Whoopi Goldberg and John Stewart. Elizabeth Bonker um, went on to just graduate from Rollins College uh, as a valedictorian. Uh, she started her own NGO and a viral video of her commencement address uh, has been on Twitter and Facebook just recently and Instagram. Um, however, we have strong reason to believe that both of these have been, uh, were written or uh, created using the tech, uh, facilitated communication or very similar techniques um, in the Bonker case of um, rapid prompting method and probably something called spelling to communicate in the um, Higashida case. And although we don't know these people personally, um, we have a lot of reasons, there's a lot of red flags that Janice often says, uh, to uh, doubt their authenticity, that they may have been, um, in fact, they likely have been written by their facilitators who thought they were actually helping uh, these people with severe autism to communicate, and they, they didn't. So you can see these, the claims that, that these were written by young people is pretty astounding. And our claims that this, if we look at the scientific evidence, that these might have been written by uh, the facilitators and not by the uh, person who, who it says is authored is also pretty um, uh, dramatic and uh, is, is, can be very sublime, hard to accept as well. Now, if now we, we quote, we start with a quote from Andrea Lolini, Professor Lolini uh, spoke yesterday, I think and today, um, and basically uh, has this wonderful quote about the neurodiversity movement and asking a question upon, you know, what if brain attributes, um, uh, which so much inequality and injustice um, have in the, in the legal system today, what if, you know, that this is something of difference and not inferiority and uh, um, less than. Um, so FC proponents believe that they are not only right in the middle of the neurodiversity movement, but they are pushing it and um, uh, also um, answering some of the critics of the, uh, of the neurodiversity movement, critiques like the neurodiversity movement only works um, with mild to medium forms of neurodiversity. Um, FC proponents believe that they are working with people with severe uh, disabilities and that they are providing a profound or a prominent voice for these people. Uh, and not only that, but they're helping them, them to communicate and tap into knowledge uh, that, they, uh, that, that has not been appreciated. Uh, that brings us to questions about FC and neurodiversity. Um, do these facilitated facilitator dependent communication support neurodiversity. If you criticize FC as Janice and I do, uh, is that in support of neurodiversity or is that counter to neurodiversity? Um, who's silencing who? And then um, as Anna Stubblefield said, uh, critiques of FC are a form of hate speech. Um, and of course, we'll push back on that. Uh, Janice, do you want to do this? One? Sure. The, the problem with FC has always been who is controlling the communication. And um, as it says, um, Rosemary Crosley in Australia kind of discovered or rediscovered this form of facilitated communication. Douglas Bicklin made a connection with uh, Rosemary Crosley and brought it to Syracuse University. And they're still sort of ground zero. Um, in the United States for promoting facilitated communication, but there are other pockets that are showing up. Now, um, there's some in um, California, some in, in um, Pennsylvania. And um, the problem with their early studies is that they, they never, they, they understood there was a concern about facilitator control, um, 
but they they felt like they wanted they had discovered something great and wanted to present it to the autism community and and ended up um it caught on like i've read you know like wildfire and um soon after that <clears throat> excuse me people started doing controlled experiments where the facilitator was blinded to the test protocols and case after case after case not just um, false allegations of abuse, although that was a trigger for some of the testing, um, but like the OD Hex Center just wanted to know what it was that they were dealing with. And it turned out that when the facilitator is blinded under those um, situations, the conversation or the, the messages are based on the what the facilitator knows and not the individual being facilitated. And um, on the other side, the, the pro FC people um, put out studies saying that it did work. But if you go back and, and look, and that's what the critics of, of FC have done, and I have done based on my experience, you know, like I wanted to know what happened and why. Um, there are kind of some flaws in some in many of the studies where the facilitator wasn't blinded. In fact, in some cases, they were encouraged to help the individual with disabilities. So the question then is still, who's actually authoring the messages? Is it the person, is it the facilitator, or is it the person being facilitated? The scientific consensus on, um, on FC is very strong, strongly in favor of that FC is um, based in the idiomotor effect, confirmation bias, and motivated reasoning. Um, so. so this uh, alludes to my story. I was trained at the University of Maine by um, first generation facilitators. I also worked with some facilitators um, within the school system. What we didn't know then was that we were actually inadvertently sharing information, which is also another problem with with um, proving FC works. And um, the the tension that developed in my case um, is the FC guidelines say don't test for competence because that's a an insult to people with um, autism or, or other. Um, or others with communication difficulties. Um, but we got into, I got into a situation where the court had decided to test for authorship before deciding whether the allegations of abuse were true or not, um, which I think is the way to go. I think every case needs to be settled on a, a individual basis. But um, as we'll see, a lot of times the um, person who's being accused is even sometimes jailed before people know whether the the um, messages came from the individual or not. So, uh, I, in in my story is well documented, and again um, on the supplement, I've put I've put some information for more information. I'm happy to answer questions too about my particular story. But those are the two points on the slide that I'd like to emphasize. The um, these are the reasons why the the um, major education and health advocacy organizations oppose FC, and this includes um, RPM and supported typing, which are alternative names to FC, which we'll talk about in a minute. But lack of ev scientific evidence, whether the facilitator generated messages or those of the individual. Um, Potential for abuse by facilitators, false allegations of abuse. Um, people are making medical decisions, housing, educational decisions based on facilitated communication. And, um, and if the facilitator is actually controlling the written output, then um, it's also considered by some of these organizations as a human and civil rights violation. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the Anna Stubblefield case. Um, this was featured in the New York Times, and, um, Anna, and, and, and as a professor, this is very interesting to me. I'm always interested in when professors uh, commit human rights abuses. Um, Anna Stubblefield was a professor of philosophy at Rutgers studying race and disabilities. Um, 
she taught a course uh, at Rutgers where she showed a movie called Autism is a World, which is uh, basically a very pro FC uh, movie. Uh, one of the students said, oh, I have a brother who has uh, cerebral palsy um, and he's, he's non-speaking, uh, he's not been able to communicate, um, you know, did, would this work for him? And Stubblefield said she would work with him um, and she began uh, FC with him, even though she'd only been trained very briefly in the technique. Um, and very quickly, uh, she was claiming that he was able to communicate at very advanced levels to the point that she had him present a paper at an academic conference and then also had him publish a very short paper in Disability Studies Quarterly, a single author paper. Um, that's you know, a pretty uh, dramatic claim, but then um, she believed also that through FC, uh, he was had communicated his love for her and um, very and had consented to sexual relations and uh, they had sexual relations based upon the consent of this non-speaking man who um, did not have uh, the ability to consent had consented. Um, she told the family they were shocked uh, because every test he'd ever gone to, showed that he was unable to speak or communicate and was unable to consent. Um, and so they told her to stay away. Uh, she did not. Um, the uh, family went to Rutgers and uh, Rutgers went to the police. Uh, Anna, Dr. Stubblefield was arrested. Um, she, um, it was basically a question. He, she said he and I were intellectual e equals. And the judge said, that's, you're the perfect example of a predator preying on their prey. Uh, she was convicted in the jury trial of aggravated sexual assault and uh, concurrent sentences of 12 years. Um, she was also sued by the family and won for $4 million and she was fired from Rutgers. She appealed uh, while she was in prison and uh, the appeals court uh, ruled that there should be a retrial with a different judge. And uh, she was then sentenced um, for criminal sexual contact, contact and sentenced to 22 months, which was time served. Um, the uh, appeals decision is, is fascinating and that leads to our legal analysis here. Um, basically, I'll, I'll skip to the bottom point first which is that Stubblefield in her appeal did not say and did not claim that FC was valid. Um, the, um, the judge at the trial level said that um, any evidence gathered by FC would not be allowed. Uh, and she did not counter that in her appeal. Uh, she did not say, I want to have you know, a, a, a jury actually determine if it is valid. Uh, instead, she said that some of the conversations with Rosemary Crosley, the, uh, the uh, creator of this method, uh, should be allowed because it wasn't FC. And um, the judge said, well, you should have allowed, the trial judge should have allowed this communication where it was done by a letter board in the air. And a letter board in the air is still FC or a form of FC. Uh, it is a little harder to tell that who's, you know, that there's influence on the pointing, uh, but there is. And, um, but the judge was willing to allow that in the retrial. Uh, there was no retrial as there was a settlement. Um, the aftermath is just as interesting as the case. Um, she was hailed as the modern day Ann Sullivan. Uh, disability studies faculty around the U.S. raised money for her defense. There's now an opera based upon the case. Um, Peter Singer had to weigh in with Jeff McMahon. And when Peter Singer weighs in, it's usually a red flag. Uh, Peter Singer uh, said um, there was no harm done. It's very likely he found the experience pleasurable. And for our interest in knowledge and um, epistemology, he said she was neither reckless nor negligent in forming her opinions about his abilities. And this obviously led to very strong condemnation about their editorial. And um, uh, Jody Allard 
said, until today, I would have said we can all agree, regardless of political party or ideology, that it's not okay to rape disabled people. Unfortunately, I was wrong. The, um, uh, the, the family, uh, DJ's brother was, was very upset and said, uh, me too. This was not merely touching for mutual, mutual pleasure. This was rape. She raped him two times. She did god awful things with him. And I believe the punishment is woefully inadequate. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, um, or maybe it goes along with this slide too, that um, the, the consent was given through the use of facilitated communication, but it was in the trial, the um, person that ended up being the victim, actually he had difficulty moving physically, but he actually got out of the bed and moved away from her. And she continued to pursue him. Um, and so that was one of the issues with this case, um, at least for me, disturbing um, that a person's um, valid non-verbal -commun non communication could be ignored um, and the, in, in lieu of facilitated communicated messages. And I, I see we are at 20 minutes already, so, uh, and we haven't even got to our legal analysis. So I think we'll uh, go through this, uh, the legal analysis in just a few minutes, and if that's okay, Janice, and then we'll yes. hope to save some time for questions. So yep. we only are looking at two issues in the law, two very complicated issues. Uh, one of them is about witness testimony. And here's a, uh, the summary of our legal analysis is that judges are increasingly, at least in the US, uh, the gatekeepers of what is scientific testimony. Um, Justice Rehnquist said in a, a case on this that you were, we're asking judges to be amateur scientists and most are not qualified and they can be deceived just like anyone else. Uh, FC puts a lot of pressure on the epistemology of the legal system about how they know what, you know, where, who, who is an expert, uh, what is, counts as evidence, et cetera. Um, and one of the reasons courts are not set up to deal with pseudosciences is in part because the academy is getting worse and worse in dealing with pseudosciences. Um, and then we need to have a better method for culpability for epistemic irresponsibility. Um, um, I think um, for this, I'll just say that this is not a critique of augmentative and alternative communication as a whole, but a specific subset of techniques. And you see that most of the pictures we've shown to, before are of FC or RPM. This is a legitimate form of AAC being used in this picture. Um, and we go through the two main schools of thought of um, witness testimony being allowed in courts. And basically we say that FC fails both um, uh, the old and the new standards. Uh, and we go through why that is, uh, but we can, and, and Janice, do you wanna talk about this? Yeah, it's, um, FC can look really um, real. The facilitator, as, as particularly if facilitators and their, their individual they're working with have worked together for a long time. The cues become very, very subtle. And unless you actually know what to look for, you may miss it. It, it can look like it's independent communication when it actually is dependent on the facilitator cues. And then it gets even more confusing for judges and uh, is that FC has been rebranded. Um, the Syracuse Institute is no longer called the Facilitated Communication Institute. It's called the Institute for Communicative Inclusiveness or something like that. Um, and then um, there's also um, more and more universities um, have either uh, professors who teach this, that this is a valid technique, or they have held workshops on this or they um, have had students graduate as in uh, Ms. Bonker's case, Ms. Bonker's case uh, from Rollins College. And so it gets harder and harder for judges to uh, decide what is science and what is not. Uh, and I love this slide that Janice made. There's, um, I think it's really difficult to figure out 
if you if you're new to FC, who are the expert witnesses? And so I compared these programs. Like Syracuse University has a program that supports facilitated communication, and but the the communication and sciences disorders opposes it. And so these programs tend to be the ones that support it tend to be um, promote more social and emotional practices. And I'm making a generalization here. There's probably some crossover, but the the people who oppose um, facilitated communication tend to promote evidence based practices. So there's also a tension in terms of um, what those um, uh, categories mean. And and it, this is really nice because you can see Syracuse has an institute that supports FC, and then it has a department that's spoken out against it. Virginia the same way, Penn State the same way. Um, and so it's difficult, you know, okay, who's your expert from Syracuse? Well, it depends on which department you're calling for. Yeah. Um, I think we'll skip that slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do look at, we do a pretty intense case analysis of lower court opinions. Uh, we find that some uh, are allowing uh, or will allow FC to be, FC testimony to be used. Uh, some judges have actually have conducted their own test in their in their chambers to see if communication is happening. Some have allowed it, some have not. Uh, very recent case out of Indiana. Uh, basically, they were going to allow facilitated communication to be used as evidence. Um, we then talk about, and I apologize for skimming through this. We then talk about where is uh, responsibility here if you, you do use, uh, you know, if, if somebody ha has a false claim of sexual abuse and that person, that evidence, like in Janice's case, came from the facilitator and not from the person, you know, should lawyers be held accountable for that? Should police, should, should the facilitator be held accountable when they should have known? And that's a, a term, uh, in, in, legally it's called willful ignorance. And we argue, and I so apologize for going through this quickly, uh, that Anna Stubblefield in, in her case was willfully ignorant. She had every reason to know that FC was not a valid technique. Um, and if you are um, legally, you know, if you are um, brought up on charges based upon evidence that was gathered by FC, what kind of you know, what kind of, um, uh, you know, how, what can you do about it? And there have been suits and uh, counter suits uh, for being falsely accused. And we find this incredible case out of Florida just from last year um, that this man was put in jail for 35 days um, and his uh, kid was taken away from him uh, based upon false claims that he had raped his seven-year-old son. Um, and he sued and he basically, it was on the grounds of willful ignorance that there was no way the police should not have known. There was no way the, uh, uh, uh prosecuting attorney should not have known. There was no way the school board, which was involved in this should not have known. And, uh, we unfortunately do not have, since this was settled out of court and it's a secret settlement. We do not know exactly what the grounds was, but, but there was uh, damages awarded to him for false imprisonment. So um, we'll just uh, summarize that this is, puts a lot of stress on the legal system. And I'll skip to the last point, which is that not only are judges confused about FC, we're, we're very worried that judges will get confused with any form of AAC in their courts and might not allow uh, or they might silence neurodiverse individuals by not allowing them to use AAC, which are valid. So uh, we, this is our first time presenting any of this information at a neurodiversity conference. We'd really love to continue the conversation. We'd love to get your input on this, both pro and con. I mean, we're, this is something that fascinates us. So please, um, you know, let, let's continue the conversation. Thank you very much for that, Janice. You have uh, responded to I think all the questions that popped up, thank you very much for that. The last one, can I just ask in my ignorance, AAC, would you mind spelling out what that is? Yeah, that's augmentative and alternative communication. So <laughs> that it's uh, like letter boards, high and low tech, um, sign language, um, 
sure. you know, body language, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so and and the difference get mixed up. Yeah, the difference between FC and AAC, the concern is the facilitated, the assistant control over the communication. It could it could be eye tracking or whatever, but if the facilitator is influencing the communication, then that's the problem. It's not necessarily the the device itself. Sure. We have one quick question and then we have, have to go to the next. What more can the well-informed do to oppose FC versus AAC? Yeah, I think educating yourselves and, and that's what our website is designed to do. And um, people can contact me there if they have further questions. And I've got contacts. If I don't know the answer, I've got contacts that are helping me out. So ask a lot of questions. Sure. Questions are always good. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here today and informing us on, on this.